So our agenda as we go through this, um, what I wanna do here is to go through the introductions and ground rules, then talk about the concepts of decoding an investor call and what does that actually really mean? And uh, we'll share that with you and give you some different ideas. Um, and then I'm gonna just also open it up to the floor for Q&A and we've created for you a takeaway tool. Uh, I hope that this takeaway tool is something that uh, you'll be able to use and really make reference to uh, as you start to think about the process of applying some of the things that we're gonna share during the session. So in an introduction to all of you from me, my name is Rob Brodo. I am the president and CEO of Advantex. Just to give you a real quick background, I have more than 25 years of experience conducting leadership and business acumen training programs. And obviously, as you can imagine, most of those years were done in front of a live in-person classroom setting. And as a matter of fact, as you can see from my setting today, I'm actually in the virtual classroom where we've been for several months. And interestingly enough, as a company, we've had about 75% of all of the in-person programs that we had booked have now been able to evolve into online and virtual, which has been fantastic. I work with a number of different types of organizations and industries, General Electric, Merck, DuPont, ADP, and you can see the list here. And we continue to deliver literally around the world now in this virtual environment. Next week, I'm actually going to deliver three different unique client programs around the clock uh, for different clients. And it's going to be a very interesting experience uh, in terms of being able to do that virtually. I am a graduate of the Wharton School of Business. Some introductions and disclaimer information, very important. I want everybody to know as we get started that all of the information uh, that we're going to share with you in this webinar has been compiled from sources of information, including investor company sites of the examples that I'm going to use to illustrate concepts and ideas. So very important to let you know that all the information that I use here is in the public domain. The organizations that I will mention today are not Advantex clients. We have no other information about them than what's in the public domain. And I've chosen different companies and different examples of investor calls and situations uh, that organizations are going through just for learning purposes. Very similar to how you might go to a business class at any leading university or business school program. And they'll say, oh, let's you know, talk about company X or let's talk about company Y. This is all public domain information. And I think the most important thing I'll share up front is that any information or insights or opinions that are given to you from the facilitators are not meant to convey any investor advice or recommendations. This is for learning purposes only. All right. So some ground rules. Please uh, raise your hand or chat with us. You will see that we are joined by three different folks from Advantex, Jason Sager, Sydney Freeman, and Jim Brodo. All three are gonna help me deliver this webinar for you today. If you have a question, raise your hand, chat with us. This is interactive. I really, really wanna make sure that you know that we will take the time to answer any question for you and so just let us know and we will stop and pause. It's a safe learning environment, which means there's no such thing as a bad question. If you want definitions, if you want further clarity, we are happy again to pause and give that to you. And then thirdly, let's have some fun. It's Friday uh, for many folks in the United States. The weather uh, looks like it's getting warmer. I certainly know here on the East Coast, uh, we're based right outside of Philadelphia. Supposed to actually go into the 80s today. So let's have some fun. Let's learn some things and let's uh, let's get right to it. So um, introduction. This program is called Decoding the Investor Call and it's been built exclusively for um, HR professionals. And we understand that your role has never been more critical uh, as part of the process of working in organizations. And as we go through this, 
executives, functional managers, they're turning to you for lots of things. They're turning to you for virtual skills. Like, how do I use Zoom? How do I use WebEx? Help me, help me. They're turning to you for talent acquisition. They're turning to you for engagement support, which means how do I keep people motivated? These are tough times. How do I keep them engaged? They're turning to you for performance management and much more. And as you think about the evolving role of the HR professional, real business value is achieved when an HR project is directly related to the achievement of one of the company or one of your division's specific business objectives. Um, and those objectives could be financially driven, they could be operating driven, they could be strategic matters. So all of this is happening today in your worlds. And as we start to think about it, to achieve real business value, you've got to evolve. You've got to evolve from being a great HR professional to being a valuable business professional. So how do we do that? Well, it depends on your ability to develop deep business acumen skills. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a moment. It means understanding the business. It means understanding the investor call. So what's an investor call? Every quarter, publicly traded organizations conduct a call with investors where they review the earnings of the organization. How did we do? What were some of the achievements? What were some of the um, results that we have? And what are some of the guidance principles moving forward. And right now, it's very, very volatile. Having the opportunity to develop these skills will give you an advantage to interact with your CEO, to interact with executives, to interact with line managers on the business aspects of what's happening with your business. And it will then help inform you of how can you then execute on the execution strategy of the HR and how can you start to get even more valuable uh, in your roles? So I put together some learning objectives for the session, and here they are. At the conclusion of our webinar, we want you to have a better understanding of how to decode an investor call, including the following. What's the real and hidden meaning of the CEO's first three minutes? So there's a skill set by which we're gonna introduce you to the concepts of understanding the first three minutes of an investor call and understand what's really being said and what are some of the hidden meanings in there. We're gonna give you the opportunity to understand the secret meaning behind some investor call jargon, the buzzwords that they use, what do they mean, how can I interpret them, how can I decode them for my role and my job. And what are some of the key reports that are discussed uh, during these calls? What are some of the key metrics related to those reports? At the end of the session, we will send you a takeaway tool that summarizes all of the business acumen you need to become a better partner to your business and then to decode your own company's investor call. So it's a PDF file that I've created for you as a real nice takeaway tool. All right, let's get started. Decoding the investor call. We're going to start by doing something that I call play the up or down game. So what we're going to do is we're going to look over to you as participants. And when I show the brand of a company, I'm going to ask you the following question each time. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, do you think that this company has been up or down in terms of its stock price? And so the way that we're going to look to you to give us an answer, chat with us. Give us a chat on do you think it's up or down, and then we'll unveil after each one of these uh, to show you what it was like. So without any further ado, Jason and Sid, if you are ready, uh, we are going to start to play the stock up. Here we go. First one is, of course, in the United States is a retail organization. And um, in terms of how they're doing uh, from a retail perspective, uh, do you think that their stock is up or down? 
send those chats in to us. Got quite a few downs rolling in. Quite a few downs, huh, Jace? We'll give you a couple more seconds. Up down or down? With a, down with an exclamation point. Oh boy, all right, good. Well, I can see that, that these folks are gonna get this game pretty well. So here's the latest data as of um, just two days ago as I was preparing this presentation for everybody. So Macy's, uh, as you start to see here, and I'm gonna bring out my little laser pointer, um, started the year in early January around 16 or $17 per share. And then things were going, things were going, you know, retail is kind of a tough environment. Then all of a sudden we hit this situation, this challenge, and it is down to about $5 a share. So it's down 65% since the beginning of the pandemic. All right, Zoom. Zoom, of course, being the tool that we're using today uh, in terms of better connectivity and virtual meetings. Up or down, people? Looking pretty unanimous. Pretty unanimous? Oh, yeah, I would say so. Let's go right to it. Zoom, since the beginning, um, they were down there about uh, $55 a share, $60 a share. They have gone up 110%. They're over $150 since the beginning. So now we're starting to see what's the volatility here. Let's go to the next one. This is an interesting one. General Motors. General Motors, of course, is the world's largest producer of automobiles. And the question on the floor is stock price, up or down? Hmm, someone says even, no change. We have a <laughs> down, another flat. Some more down. Kind of mixed, huh, Jace? Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's do the big reveal. So they're down about 30%. Um, but what's interesting is you take a look at this, and I'm going to use the laser pointer. So they're doing okay, they're doing okay. And then all of a sudden, around mid-February into March, things start looking you know, pretty bad here. Because think about it, if people are at home and they're not going and buying cars, there's going to be a pretty significant impact. But you'll notice that it hit this bottom um, but then it kind of stayed down here up a little bit, up a little bit. And over time, it's been kind of there um, coming back very, very slowly. Now, let's, let's talk about another automobile manufacturer, Tesla. So again, the same sorts of principles would be at play here. Uh, it's an automobile, uh, same sort of factor in terms of, hmm, people, are they able to go out and buy a car? What are we looking at here, Jason, in terms of some early responses? I got a way up, I got a down. I got, <laughs> I got an up, I got a down. <laughs> I got an even. This is a fun game. Let's give the reveal. Tesla is up 67%. So what's the difference between a Tesla and a General Motors? Well, interestingly enough, Tesla has gone to 100% virtual delivery of vehicles. You go online, you pick the car that you want, you order it, and then they drop it off in your driveway. Um, it is a completely virtual touchless scenario. The investor said, oh my goodness, that's wonderful. This is great. I want to buy a car and I want to buy your stock. I'm gonna use Tesla as one of our case studies. And I actually went through the whole Tesla investor call and I'm gonna use that as one of the case studies to go through to teach you all how to decode. Intel. <clears throat> Intel, of course, is an organization that produces the chips that go in computers. Intel, stock price, up or down? And Jace, you can read them aloud to me. That would be kind of fun. Yeah, up, 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 up. Hmm. 
So people are thinking, okay, um, business is going to go virtual. People are working at home. What's going on? We need computers. And, and flat. So basically in the beginning, they were around $60 a share. Things were growing. Things were looking good in February. Then all of a sudden COVID hits and things started to go down. But look at that volatility. That's pretty rocky. It's down. It's up. It's down. It's up. It's down. But it's made a comeback. But to the end of this, Intel is exactly at the same place where it was when it started the year. And so what do we make of that? What we make of that is probably some concerns about disposable income and business spending on new equipment. So a stock price like Intel is dependent upon uh, new sales. So it's interesting, zero. Goldman Sachs, financial company. Uh, Goldman Sachs, of course, is a Wall Street company making big bets and big investments in institutional mutual funds and making money for lots of people. Jace, what do we got here? Got Financial down, services. Down. Two, three downs. And up More downs. Four, five downs. <laughs> Financial downs, services. Two ups. It's down 20%. So again, look at the smoothness of this curve. Everything's fine. It's down as you would imagine. Oh my goodness, things are looking bad, start to come up, but pretty smooth in terms of the, it, the curve. And we can look at that. And again, difference in terms of volatility. Corn Ferry, Corn Ferry, professional services firm, um, the world's largest human resources firm. And many of you HR business professionals know them quite well great company. They um, help you hire your executives. They have assessments. They have training and development programs. Um, they're a publicly traded company. How do you think they're doing? Got two downs, three downs, four downs, one up. Everybody's pretty good at this game. They're down 31%. Big drop off as people said, ooh, worried about uh, new talent acquisition, worried about development of people, professional services firm, highly people dependent, down 31%. Pharmaceutical company. And I'm trying to give everyone uh, some real different industries here. Sanofi, one of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies. Um, the reason I chose them is one of their products is a product that had been talked about a lot as an emergency medication for COVID-19. Um, so they were pretty interesting out there. Jason, what do we have here? Got one, two, three ups, four ups. Flat. But look at this volatility. Um, here's what happened. Again, just regular. Then all of a sudden, when everything started to go south, they were up and they were down. They were up. What's happening here is the fact that there was a lot of press about the product uh, that could be taken uh, as a last resort to fight off uh, some of the impact of COVID-19 uh, on people. And so you're seeing a different volatility here, but flat from where it all started. And last one, um, Lyft. Lyft, of course, is an organization. Uh, it is a mobile application for mobile transportation. How do you think Lyft did? And I'll just, as you're thinking, Lyft is the other case study that I'll use to decode the investor call. So Jace, what do we got? Everybody says down. Everybody says down, but not down that much. As you would think, you would think, oh my goodness, if everybody's at home, uh, if everybody's not going out, if they're not going to restaurants, you think, my gosh, it would be like off the cliff. But as we're going to explore and as I'm going to use in terms of the lessons to teach you to understand the uh, investor call, they did some things and they said some things in their earnings and investor call to really flatten out the curve here. So very, very interesting. And thank you all for that uh, interactivity. Uh, great, great job. And I'm really happy to hear uh, you kind of got this game and did really well with it. All right, let's get into the meat of the matter. And I'm going to call this the first three minutes. So the first three minutes of the investor call basically is going to contain the big message. What are the things that 
I want to say as the CEO or the CFO or the leader of the company in the first three minutes to deliver the big message that everybody gets. And so the first three minutes is when the CEO typically is going to deliver how did we do in the first quarter? What type of quarter did we have? What were the one to three drivers, the factors impacting the results? And let me put my pointer on here and give you some commentary. It's very important to understand that in these first three minutes, you're making your first impression. You've got to understand and decipher what's being said, but what's being said are just a couple of things. What are the drivers? What are the factors, good or bad, impacting the results? You really only have one chance to do this and one chance to understand what's happening there. You must understand the data that's there to support the message. In these investor calls, the data is black or white. There's very little interpretation to them, as we will see. Typically, here's what happens. Um, there's a press release issued four to eight hours before the actual earnings call itself. Those four to eight hours are typically the time it takes for analysts to formulate their questions and to prepare. Now, I will point out, if you're delivering bad news, then the press release is typically given out after the markets have closed for the day. If you're delivering good news, um, previous to the call, you might want to get that good news out in the market and the stock price actually goes up a little bit during the day. Just again, one of the little techniques, one of the little tips to decoding the investor call. Rob, so as I mentioned, an anonymous question here about that last slide. Uh, yep. would, would you find it, would you find it typical to, or, or is it, is it typical that if, they release it during the day that it's going to be good news. I think I think uh, what they're trying to say is, you know, if they release during the day or after hours, can can we just assume that it's going to be bad news? No, I I, I wouldn't say that it's a definite one way or the other. Sometimes it's actually in the bylaws that hey, on the day of the earnings call, we have to deliver it at nine a.m. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look too much into it. What I'm sharing is just kind of a general kind of assumption and just folks on the call. I typically do with our clients, um, investor calls for about half a dozen of them. And so what I, what that means is I actually do a custom decoding the investor call. And so I'm watching and listening to all of them. I think on the whole, um, most of them would follow this rule that if it's uh, bad news, it's after earnings is over or after the day is over. But I wouldn't make, I wouldn't make too much of an assumption on that. Good question. Thanks, Jace. And, and again, folks, jump in. Just send Jason your questions and he'll jump in and, and stop uh, me and I'll go through it. All right. Case study, Lyft. What we're going to do is we're going to hear from Logan Green. He's the co-founder and chief executive officer of Lyft. And here it is. What I've done for you is I've literally cut and pasted from the transcript the opening remarks. When I do this, and as part of your learning process, I use a color coding system. Green would mean good news. Yellow would mean that there's some cautionary news and red would mean bad news. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining our call today. While Brian will briefly discuss our quarterly financial results, Brian, of course, is the CFO, most of our remarks today will address the state of the business and our future plans in the context of the current environment. So the reason I put that in yellow is that what are we doing? We're deciphering, we're looking for the big message in the first three minutes. Typically, a CEO is going to talk about the quarter. It's going to start with what's good, what our results are. It's going to paint a picture for the rest of the call that are going to reflect back the results and really build for something in the long term. What's interesting here is that Logan in the opening remark says, I'm going to get away from that typical pattern and I'm going to put it about the context of the current environment. And, and folks, that's quite unusual. 
The COVID-19 pandemic and its effects are virtually unprecedented in modern times. So this word right here, unprecedented, you have to look at the actual words being used. Big words like that, bold words like that are taken very, very carefully. And it's very rare that a CEO will use a word like unprecedented. Uh, in modern times. The virus is testing our everyday way of life and is having a profound impact on our customers and our business. And I put that in red because it's acknowledging the rea reality. And I think Logan did a really nice job here of being authentic, uh, very transparent, and you'll see what's the big message. The big message is what I'm going to talk about here today is in the context of the current environment. And we are in an unprecedented situation that is impacting our customers and our business. Very well done. And it's decoding a very, very clear message. Question coming in. How long do they usually prep for, uh, for the delivery of this? Nice question. Thank you folks for that. Um, Typically, <laughs> I, I, the, the truth of the matter is um, the prep for the next call starts the afternoon of the call you just did. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with many different executives on preparing for these, and it's a nonstop process. I'd say the heavy lifting uh, is done about um, a month before. And then, of course, as the data comes in, when they close the books, that's when they go into the intense mode. And for the three to five days before it, I'd say it's taking 80% to 90% of the executive team's time, typically the CEO and CFO. Thanks for that great question, Jace. Continuing on, here are the facts. And I put that in green because, again, I just want to acknowledge the fact that here are the facts. In mid-March, we began to experience a sharp decline in rides as various authorities across the North America issued guidelines and orders for residents to minimize time spent outside. Okay, that's it. That's the facts. It's giving us uh, very clearly. For the month of April, ride shares were down 75% year over year. Hold on, hold on. Let me just absorb this for a second. When I take a look at the month of April 2020 compared to the month of April 2019, rides were down 75%. That's a pretty astounding number. Think of any business to see that your business went down 75%. Ride levels appeared, however, to have stabilized seeming to have reached bottom in the second week of April. We have since seen three consecutive weeks of week-on-week -week growth. But let me again be clear, this is down 70% overall as we take a look at quarter by quarter. So again, I think it's really important to see and understand exactly the clarity of this. And so really nice job here. We cannot predict the trajectory or timing of the eventual recovery, but it is clear that macro trends will continue to negatively impact our business. And so all of this is in red. As the shelter orders stay in, the strength and duration of these headwinds cannot presently be estimated. These are the hard truths that we're facing. Here's a key word right here. It's called headwinds. That is one of the most significant words that are used in investor calls. A headwind is like flying a plane. So you're in the plane, but the wind is coming at you and it's making the trip even harder than the trip it is. The other word that is used is tailwinds. The tailwinds means that the wind is at your back of the plane and it's helping make your trip easier. Typically in business and typically in the investor calls, you use the word tailwinds when things are going great. The economy is going great. Production is great. Uh, the employment is great. And quite frankly, the last three or four years, as the markets have increased and as companies have done well and as employment has gone up and unemployment has gone down, people talk about the tailwinds that have been able to really drive and support the business. But again, here we are. It's a page of red. Question from, uh, question from Daniel. Can you also discuss decoding the final three minutes as well that the investor Q&A session? 
Yeah, absolutely, uh, Daniel. Uh, thanks for that question. So typically, the, the last three minutes of the investor call, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, that's pretty unpredictable. Um, those analysts are going to prepare their questions and they're going to dig in on the things that were stated. They're going to dig in on their uh, interpretation. Typically, the executive teams prepare for the worst. Like they'll actually do role plays and they'll, they'll say, oh man, you know, that Daniel uh, from Goldman Sachs, he's a pretty tough ass and he's going to ask some real hard questions. They, they prepare for those. Um, and the key words there, again, are going to be openness and transparency. And I think the biggest lesson that I would say is if you say something in the Q&A at the end and you're going to give a prediction or guidance, you better well deliver on that. Because when you miss the guidance, you're losing credibility and not just a little credibility, you're losing all of your credibility. And you do that two quarters in a row or three quarters in a row, you actually might be looking for a new job. So Dan, thanks for that question. All right, let's now take a look at Tesla. What I'm trying to do here in giving you a lesson is giving you kind of a bad scenario and we're gonna give you a different good scenario. Now, I will preface my remarks by saying Elon Musk is a different character. He is not a typical CEO. Um, his demeanor, his approach is not typical, but I think it's interesting for comparing and contrasting. Who starts an investor call by saying, so Q1 ended up being a strong quarter despite many challenges in the final few weeks? I mean, it's to the point, but it's pretty laid back, which is very much akin to his style. This is the first time we have achieved positive gap next net income in a seasonally weak first quarter. All right, let me decode what this sentence means. First of all, positive gap net income. That means that they made a profit for the first time in the history of the company. Gap stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. It's basically the regulatory body that oversees all of financial reporting. And so it's basically certified. So it's the first time that we've been positive gap net income. The other key words here in a seasonally weak first quarter, what that decodes to mean is that typically in the car business, the first quarter, that's January 1st through March 31st, is a very, very weak time to buy cars. Uh, the year's over, you know, Christmas is over, people don't have a lot of money, it's the middle of winter, you're not thinking about a new car, it's a pretty weak time. So to be able to make a profit here is a pretty nice thing. Even with all the challenges, we achieved a 20% automotive gross margin. What that means is they made a profit and that profit was 20% given the challenges. So again, he's acknowledging to a little bit of the extent that um, yeah, we had to shut our factory, uh, but we were able to ramp up two major new products. So all green here. We have a quick question. Uh, when a CEO or leadership team manages multiple public organizations, does one's successes or failures impact the other's earnings? Mm. So I might be talking about like the boring company, SpaceX. Yeah. Unpacking the test. Yeah. And there's a couple CEOs like Elon Musk. Um, and the other one that comes to mind is Jack Dorsey, uh, who is the CEO of both Twitter and Square. And so the question being, when a CEO is talking about one company and they're also running other companies, does their talk and the decoding call impact the others? And I'm going to say that's a, first of all, it's a great question. And secondly, yes, it's all about credibility. It's all about, are you doing what you say? Are you delivering on what you're um, promising to the market. So if you say one thing at a Tesla and then all of a sudden, you know, you're not doing so well or you miss the mark here, next time you're getting up in front of the group to talk about SpaceX, they're going to look at you quite differently. 
Great question. So I think there's a lot of uh, very important commonality, and that's a real challenge to somebody like an Elon Musk or Jack Dorsey. Um, Q1, we produced more Model Ys in first quarter than Model 3s. Uh, for the first quarters, that's all good. Thus far, the Model Y ramp has been either has been even faster, and he's talking about some of their vehicles. Most surprisingly, as otherwise, we are ahead of schedule that we were ahead of already. So let me decode what that means. He had promised that we would be doing really well and that we would be ahead of schedule. And now basically he's saying we're actually ahead of that schedule. And so that's a dangerous little thing to say because now you've set an expectation, but Elon Musk doesn't really care. Most surprisingly, Model Y was profitable already in the first quarter of production, something we haven't achieved with any other product in the, fa in the past. So all green, all good, not very clear, um, not very energetic in terms of the way that it's delivered. But again, when you're decoding this, you have to look at the data, you have to look at the facts. And the fact is they made a profit for the first time uh, in Q1. They've never done that before. Now let's get into the numbers. So the numbers, the numbers are when the chief financial officer details the actual numbers of the company. And these were released in the last few hours. So the things that we're looking for, how do the numbers tell the story? What are the most important numbers? And here's where we start to get into the skill. I could look at, and most financial people, could look at a financial report, an income statement, a balance sheet, a cash flow report, and it could be a terrible story, but I promise you, I could pick out some things that would make it sound like a great story. What we have to do here is we have to understand what are the numbers really telling us? What's the story? And what are really the most important numbers that are related to the strategy and long-term success of the business? That's the skill here. What drivers are impacting those numbers? And then what is the guidance looking forward? The interesting thing that I'll share with you as you're starting to build your skill set is that the stock price of today, the numbers of today during the investor call have actually very little to do with what happened today. The stock price is about 80% of what people think you're going to do in the future. So the guidance portion of the investor call is really, really critical. All right, let's go back to our case study, Lyft. This is Brian Roberts, a different Brian Roberts than the Brian Roberts that runs Comcast. He's the CFO of Lyft. And let's take a look at what he says. Before I get into specifics regarding our Q1 performance, I want to stress that while COVID-19 possesses a formidable challenge, we believe we are well positioned to navigate the crisis. That's a pretty bold statement. So what do the numbers say? We have a strong balance sheet. Ending the quarter, we have $2.7 billion of unrestricted cash. What does that mean? We have a bank account. And in that bank account, we have $2.7 billion. Unrestricted means I can basically do with it whatever I want. There's no covenants, there's no rules, there's no uh, regulations to say, oh, I have to invest it in new R&D, or I have to invest it in um, new software. I can do with it what I want, including keeping people on payroll and keeping them paid. So that's an interesting statement. Our business is a highly resilient model, given approximately two thirds of our cost are variable. That's big. What does that mean? That means the model is actually pretty flexible because the cost structure is variable. So the cost structures for things like auto insurance, which, which is the single biggest cost that they have, is get this, virtually 100% variable, which means if there aren't drivers out there picking people up and driving them from location to location, they don't have to pay that cost because it's variable. Unlike a manufacturing company that has plant 
and property and equipment that their sunk costs that they have to pay for that are already paid for, that's called a fixed cost. So it's interesting as you start to decode this to understand what's the message. The message here is, you know what? It's not that bad. The message here is we have a pretty flexible model. Q1 revenue trend was exceeding our expectations by the middle of March. Okay, fine, things are going pretty well. But then it fell by that 80% uh, starting that week of March 29th when everything changed. However, even though the last couple of weeks of March were not very good, we ultimately closed the year with revenue of $956 million. Get that, just a little under a billion dollars for Lyft, and that's up 23%. Okay, again, it's now showing you and you're deciphering the meaning and the call uh, information. Every rider who got into a Lyft vehicle in Q1 basically generated $45.06 for Lyft. Pretty big number. Active riders increased by 3.5%, but it declined from Q4 as we started to see the COVID-19 crisis worsen. So again, acknowledging the reality. There was a quick question uh, if Uber was similar in their stock price. So I just did a quick look up and it was at 34 around the beginning of January. It's at 32 now. So they really, they went down a significant amount, uh, mm -hmm. but they're back up to just $2 short of what they were at the beginning of January. Nice. Thanks for that, Chase. Good question. Um, so bottom line here is that notwithstanding the revenue issues in mid-March, Lyft had an exceptional quarter. Uh, exceptional. You know, it's hard to use those words in this time, but they did. Adjusted EBITDA, which stands for earnings before interest tax and depreciation, was $85 million uh, compared, to, compared to a loss. Let me, just, let me just point that out, folks. They lost $216 million in the same period a year ago. So going from losing $216 million to making $85 million is like super huge. And again, you're just picking that up by reading through. Uh, EBITDA, uh, change, and then the overall performance. So basically, you know, going through these numbers, talking about what it looked like last year, what it looks like now, where are we going? But here's the thing, and that's why I put it in red. It will take time for us to return to the ride volume achieved in Q1. But the first quarter exemplifies the margin potential we can expect to resume following the recovery. So what's the story? What do I decode? Hey, things were good. Unprecedented event. Things are going to be bad. We have a flexible model. We have cash in the bank. We'll be able to survive. But we have everything in place here to say that when things recover, because we're able to now figure out how to make a profit, we will be good. And to the question that Jason just asked before, um, or one of you asked before, compared to Uber, that's really good. Uber has yet to ever make a profit. So I think that's a really interesting story. All right, now let's do the same for Tesla. This is Zach Kirkhorn. Uh, Zach is the CFO of Tesla, basically echoing what um, Elon Musk said, talked about, hey, we did the launch, we demonstrated profitability for the first time, we launched a new product. Um, it made money from the very, very beginning. We've never done that before. But Rob says, notice something here, folks, no numbers. Whereas the Lyft example talked a lot about the numbers, a lot of information, very, very well documented. This is just some words not actually talking about the profitability itself. So what does that mean? That means we were profitable, but I'm not going to quite show you what the numbers are because they're not really that great. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, it's hard to understate the significance of demonstrating profitability. All right, that's all fine. We also announced long-range performance of the Model 3 on our roadmap. Um, and what's interesting here, as they start to take a look at production, they start to take a look at things like the order rates. They exited the last quarter with the highest ever bookings backlog. 
What that means is people go online, they order their vehicles. They're not always in inventory. They have to actually make them. And so as they're looking forward, the highest backlog ever. But again, notice no numbers. No numbers here at all. Is the backlog up 30% or is it up 40%? We have to interpret that as that it's good, but there's not a lot of big numbers to actually support that. And by these accomplishments, we're able to achieve a first ever Q1 profit. All right, then what we do is after we've taken a look at the big picture, after we've taken a look at some of the numbers, the next thing that is typically occurring in the investor call is the charts that put the key highlights. So they're typically just like this. They're one pagers, key highlights, and they're gonna emphasize what I want you to understand. Well, key highlight number one, 57% record contribution margin. Okay, good. Um, our loss from an EBITDA perspective was 85 million, but we still made a profit uh, from the cash perspective. And we have $2.7 billion in cash. Remember I talked about, you're gonna learn the key metrics. These are the key metrics of the story of Lyft. This is the three big things that they wanted you to know. Profitability is up. EBITDA loss is getting better. That means that after earnings, before interest taxes and depreciation, we lost a little bit of money, but the business itself is making money. I just have some debt on my books that I'm paying interest for, which is why my EBIT is lower. And then I have cash in the bank, all fantastic news. You'll then see what happens is they'll go through and look at the consolidated uh, statement of operations. And this is the place where you'll see the revenue and then all the costs are broken out. And you'll be able to actually see what are the line items for all of the different cost elements. This is Tesla. So Tesla has three things. It's funny how everybody has three things I want you to know. Cash, um, $1.8 billion increase in our cash. Uh, we now have, look at that number. We now have $8 billion in cash. That's huge. Profitability, here's your numbers. $283 million in operating income, $16 million in gap net income. And here we go and you know, I had said there's a reason why we didn't show numbers. You know, $16 million on um, profitability relative to an $8 billion company, it's not a lot. It's great, it's wonderful news, but it's, it's not a lot. And then operational, Model Y is delivering um, increased uh, range of Model S uh, going in terms of battery capacity, and then uh, production of 1,000 solar roof panels in a week, which obviously, the, separate business, but they wanted to stick that in as well. Then of course, you'll see the overall financial summary. Uh, again, revenue, total revenue, operating expenses, uh, profitability, and then the bottom line, and you'll see the cash position. All right, final part of our call today. Keywords and metrics. These are five key earning calls jargon phrases. I reviewed with you headwinds. That means we're running into some trouble. Tailwinds, that means we have the wind behind our backs and things are going great. Volatility, that means, oh, I'm looking out there and we're seeing some volatility in the market. That means it's gonna be unpredictable. FX impact, FX stands for foreign exchange. That means we were profitable or we lost some money, but then on top of that, because of the changes of currency, it's actually impacted our business. And classic example, I made a million dollars of profit in Europe. And in the bank account of Europe, my million dollars sits, but then when I bring it back to the US, I have to adjust for the currency and I may have actually lost some value there. So that's the jargon that you wanna take a look at there. And then basis points. Basis points is typically associated with profitability. Um, and basis points means that it's a percentage up or percentage down. 
And so a basis points, if I'm looking at my contribution margin is 10% and I raise it to 10.1, that's 10 basis points. And it's just another way of using some language that sounds a lot bigger uh, than it really is. And so in the tool that I'm gonna give you as a takeaway, uh, we have things defined for you like revenue, cost of goods sold, gross margin, operating expenses, operating margin, net income, and a lot, lot more uh, in the tool. And I think you're gonna have uh, a good time with that. And we explain all of these items. All right, Jason, Q&A, what do we got? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, we got one, how, how do companies typically leverage earnings calls or these purely financial metrics or documents uh, to, to help, help people with their day-to-day -day tasks? Mm. So I think that's a, a line of sight question. Yeah, R wonderful question. So ma making that transition from the earnings call to how can, you know, if you're an HR professional, if you're even, you know, obviously a line manager, middle level leader who's, you know, kind of figuring all this out. I, I think the best way to answer that question is to look at it from three perspectives. The 50,000 foot view. How did we do? Where are we going? Just kind of real big picture. I then think there's a 50 foot view perspective and saying, okay, am I going to have enough cash to run my business? Are we doing anything differently because of these results? And the results could be good or the results could be bad. And then the third perspective is, is literally the five foot view. Like what does it mean to me today? And most of the time, most of the time, it has not a lot of meaning to what I'm doing today, unless there's some sort of major announcement. We're spinning off a business unit, or we're uh, closing down a business unit, or things have been, we're terminating people. Then clearly, that's something that means today. But I think it's more of a medium term and a long term uh, view in terms of understanding the data and then making any tactical decisions. Nice question. Thank you. Uh, next question. What is your opinion on whether or not the market has hit bottom? Uh, again, let me just preface this. This is not investor advice. This is just meant to be an answer to the question. Um, I think we had already hit rock, bucket, rock bottom. I think we're up a little bit. I do think we're gonna see an, another fairly significant downturn that may be worse than mid March, but then it'll start to come back up. So unfortunately, my answer to the question is that um, I don't think we've actually hit rock bottom. Okay. Uh, next question. Do you have any advice? Do you have any advice for us? Sorry about the. Yep. Jace, I think we lost you. Let me see what we have here. I got it. Do we have any advice to help us manage the message when your company issues a dividend at the same time they are laying off or furloughing workers? Uh, wow. Uh, Melissa, thank you for that question. Um, it's a tough one. I, I think he, here's the answer that I would give. That folks, listen, um, it's the investors who have given us the money to run our business. It's the investors who have taken the risk. And for the money that they've given us, they need and expect a return. And unfortunately, in order us, for us to find that right balance of long-term survival and giving back to the investors for um, what they've given us to run the business, we've had to make some adjustments in workforce. And it doesn't sound great, um, and unfortunately, if you're furloughed, we hope to bring you back. And it's just the reality of the day that we have to find this balance. And it's, it's, it's the right answer, uh, and it's the honest answer. Good. Any other questions? Yeah, another question. What, what impact, if any, do the, do the funds coming from government sources have on these statements or calls? Oh, nice, nice question. So... Funds coming from the government to business are going to show up on the balance sheet and the balance sheet only. 
uh, in terms of the acceptance of those funds. Now, they're then used for one thing and one thing only, and that is to pay people. It's the Payroll Protection Act. And so you'll see that there's an increased or same level of expense on the P&L, which will drop down to the profitability, but it doesn't hit revenue, doesn't hit cost of goods sold unless it's a pure manufacturing play. Um, but it's typically showing up on cash on balance sheet, and then it will be impacted in terms of net income. It's a coverage of employee expenses. Got a question in the chat. Do you need to listen and analyze several calls? What tips to find themes or promise keeping track record? Nice, nice question. Um, yeah, I, I, this is like anything else where you're learning to build a skill. I would say it took me probably about 10 calls to really start to see the patterns and similarities uh, in terms of um, what were the commonalities. And in terms of keeping the track record, there are some really interesting third-party services that are free. I use a service called Seeking Alpha. Seeking Alpha. And um, the free part of the service, it gives you opinions, it gives you articles. It's a real nice place to track the promises and it has like a scorecard of how companies are doing. That's a great one. And then I use the Wall Street Journal. That's another really nice one. Um, so folks, I do recognize it is top of the hour. I'm happy to stay on uh, for a little bit longer. Some of you must, I'm sure, go to other meetings, but I'll stick around for a few more minutes if there's any extra questions. Great, I think, uh, I think we're good. So Jason, Sid, thank you so much. Um, all of our participants, I hope that was really helpful. Uh, we, we have um, your email addresses. I will send out that uh, toolkit um, within the next hour. We'll get that out to you. Please let us know if there's anything we can do. Thanks, everyone. Have a great, self, uh, safe weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. This is Rob Brodo signing off.